Hi, everyone, and welcome to our third installment of Inside the Lab. Uh, this is a chance where you get to directly interact with uh, some of our experts, um, some of my, my favorite people at Phenomenix, colleagues and, and friends from, uh, from across the country, actually, which is super cool. Uh, we're in a different environment these days, so kind of fun to be able to bring uh, these wonderful people and their faces and their knowledge to you all. Um, so today our, our focus is on HPC, HP, sorry, GC basics. I say it's a, it's an early start to the morning. I usually add a little bit of levity here. So instead of my son learning how to uh, sound like a hyena, he's instead decided he likes meatballs and he likes chewing on my shoulder. So this is a new endeavor to, for this week, um, but it's definitely uh, got me a little loose on, on sleep. Uh, since we're focusing on GC, in case you didn't know it, uh, Phenomenix has a manufacturing site um, in Northern California. We make all of our own GC phases and products. Um, something cool, a little tip. Um, so we're going to go through um, and introduce all, all of our panelists today who are going to be answering your questions. Um, so we have Dr. Yuri Bella from our R&D team, Dr. Ram Kumar from our product management team, Dr. Zachary Goodard from our technical team, and Dr. Carissa Goyen from our sales team. I say doctor for, for some of us because we have PhDs and some of us because we have knowledge that resembles a PhD <laughs> in this specific field. Um, so here's how this is gonna work. Um, if you have questions, uh, please shoot them across in the chat. Uh, we're gonna focus on a couple of specific categories going through, but um, if you have questions outside those categories, throw them into the chat box, and then I'll be shooting them towards our panelists. Um, we're gonna focus on general GC basics, uh, focus on the inlets, uh, carrier gas, uh, you know, categories and questions, um, column selection and troubleshooting, um, and then finally detection and some of the tips and tricks uh, in that arena. Um, but to start with, I'm just going to let each panelist kind of give a little introduction so you know who they are and what their GC background is. Um, so Dr. Yuri, would you mind uh, starting us off? Okay, so uh, I'm in uh, chromatography all my life, uh, starting with liquid chromatography. Then uh, the name wasn't HPLC, it came later. And then I switched to gas chromatography and uh, mostly working on gas chromatography. I work for, at the Supelka, developing mostly chiral gas chromatography columns, and uh, about uh, almost 10 years now at uh, Phenomenix, developing various uh, new phases and uh, columns for gas chromatography. Yes, Yuri. Dr. Ram Kumar. Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. My name is Ram Kumar Dandapani. I'm the global product manager for gas chromatography here at Phenomenix. I've been with chromatography for around 15 years. I've worked in pharmaceutical industry, instilled a lot of uh, method development, method validation on LC and GC methods. And then uh, my PhD focused on multidimensional gas chromatographic techniques and novel sample extraction. Here at Phenomenix, I take care of uh, Zebron which is the GC brand from Phenomenix. Uh, you will see me a lot at various conferences and uh, wearing bow ties every time a different one though. And today is a perfect opportunity to wear another nice bow tie. Thank you, um, uh, Zach. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Zach Woodward and um, I've been uh, working within chromatography for 11 years. Uh, with my start in upstate New York at AMRI, uh, a pharmaceutical company for, for whom I helped to develop uh, both uh, LC and GC methods for purity analysis. And then upon moving out to California, I worked with a uh, clinical lab, Focus Diagnostics, for whom I developed liquid chromatography and solid phase extraction methods for therapeutic drug monitoring. I uh, took a brief break to uh, become a middle school science teacher, uh, which I enjoyed, and uh, but certainly missed the lab. And so I'm back uh, in the world of chromatography with Phenomenex, and I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Thanks, Zach. Hey, Carissa. Um, so I haven't been in chromatography as long as everyone else, uh, about six years. 
I actually started out as a customer of Phenomenex. I worked with GCMS in a crime lab doing a uh, drug chem analysis. And I did that for a few years and my account rep kind of brought me on board with Phenomenex and I've been here ever since. Um, initially working GC only for clinical and forensics um, and some cannabis accounts. And now I focus on Department of Health and forensic labs. Awesome, thanks Krista, thanks all. Um, myself, uh, my name is Simon Lomas. Uh, I'm the uh, manager of a, a product marketing team. Um, been at Phenomics about 15 years, uh, but initially had my start in the science uh, area of microbiology and immunology. So kind of a, a mixture of experience on my side, especially at Phenomics. So let's let's jump in. Uh, we'll, we'll start these questions off. And again, for everybody attending, please shoot your questions through the chat box. Um, and then we'll be able to uh, send them across uh, to our team members. Ah, cool, looks like we got a few right now. Um, so let's start this off. Um, maybe generally speaking, uh, Yuri, if, if you wanna start this one off, how do compounds get separated uh, with GC, kind of in general? That's, uh, uh, chromatography is uh, very understandable to people who have a uh, background in organic chemistry. So any type of interactions what come in organic chemistry, uh, to, you can use that uh, concepts to explain that separations in uh, gas chromatography. The two, uh, several parameters are important in gas, in gas chromatography. Uh, first, uh, most important probably is selectivity, which shows that uh, how far peaks are located from each other. Say they could be located like this, good selectivity, or they could be like located like this, for example, uh, some for some compounds are that selectivity is good, for some are not so good. So first step usually is that to find the stationary phase that provides a better selectivity. The, the, and I hear the approach is that uh, uh, organic chemists used to say that, say, uh, similar is soluble in similar. So there are interaction, good interaction be, between similar compounds. So uh, if you would like to find a good uh, stationary phase, it should be as close as possible by chemical nature to the compounds, uh, to your analytes, uh, what you are trying to separate. So this is first approach. So say for Polar compounds use the polar phases or non-polar non let's use that non-polar phases. It's the first step. Second one, the, there should be efficiency that uh, karma would call chromatographers. Uh, again, if you use that, uh, our fingers, it would be that some peaks might be as a, as a, as a, as a narrow as a pinky, and then uh, some others uh, might be as a the white as a, another our different uh, fingers here that so the best uh, choice uh, uh, is there is a choice of course uh, to use the sharper peaks in this case it's understandable that if, if the peaks are sharp they are separated from each other better so uh, first parameter is selectivity second parameter is efficiency if, we, if uh, we can regulate selectivity by chemi chemistry, that uh, uh, by using different stationary phases, efficiency is regulated usually by using uh, different techniques for coating and the length of the columns. Uh, if you use a longer column, we have a higher efficiency. And then uh, uh, also, of course, that, uh, the, uh, there should be some retention, sizable retention of your analytes. So they should stay on a column for, for an extended period of time. So these three parameters, uh, again, that to mention that selectivity, efficiency, and then your column should be retained these compounds. So very much the approach is experimental. And then uh, whenever, when you have some experience, you, for you it becomes much more easy. So this is basics, it's quite simple. 
Excellent. Yeah, I, th I think I, I, I totally agree with Yuri. It's all about like light dissolves light. So if the compound is polar, analyte is polar, sorry, if the analyte is polar and column is polar, then that's the best column. If the analyte is non-polar, go for a non-polar column. That's, that's the best idea. Another um, uh, way to tell how GC separates is it's primarily based on boiling point. So an analyte which has the highest boiling point that would come out uh, last, while the analyte that has the lowest boiling point would come out late. Uh, also, if you want to look at the actual uh, stationary phase, look inside the stationary phase. The innermost part in the stationary phase is where your carrier gas is. So the analyte is basically in the carrier gas. It's partitioning between the stationary phase and carrier gas. So if you give the analyte faster time to enter from the carrier gas to the stationary phase and return back, then you would get higher efficiency. That's why when you go for a smaller IP column, you get higher efficiency. So you retouched all those, the selectivity, how it is important, how light dissolves light is important, how you obtain efficiency uh, and get a GC separation. Yeah, thank you both. That, that was a, a really good overview with, with tips just included throughout. So um, looks like we, we have another one that's, uh, that comes through uh, this one more about the uh, uh, the actual liner. So, Krista, how do I choose the most appropriate liner for my application? Um, choosing a liner based on your application kind of falls into uh, not just your analyte and whether you're doing trace analysis or not. Um, so if someone's doing something like trace analysis and they have a very clean sample, I would go with a straight no wool liner um, that gets the most of your sample onto the column as possible so you can get the largest response. Um, if you're doing something like um, environmental or toxicology, you want a wool, um, a glass wool piece in the liner to catch any particulates that might not have been um, cleaned out during sample prep. So maybe a um, single taper with wool um, and and putting that towards the top so that if there is anything on, on the needle, once it's injected, it can wipe off um, the needle and, and capture that before it gets onto the column. Um, so knowing you know, whether you're doing trace or uh, general analysis or um, semi-volatiles and then knowing also like uh, how clean your extract is, is really important when choosing the liner. Awesome. Or hey, you say something? <laughs> points to add, really good points, Carissa. Uh, a few more things like uh, the liner deactivation is also very important. Uh, uh, there's a regular range of liner versus a premium deactivated liner. Uh, Zebron Plus liners are premium deactivated. They have a thicker coating of deactivation, so they last longer, especially if you're working with active compounds pesticides that can break down, having a premium deactivation helps. Also, if you have a regular sample and if you're using a premium liner, then the deactivation lasts longer, so the lifetime of the liner would be longer with a premium deactivated liner. Yeah. On, to touch on those um, Zebron Plus liners, the other really nice thing about them is they're touchless, so you can just peel back the package and drop the liner into the inlet. And that kind of takes away um, the possibility of phthalates transferring from your gloves and getting onto that liner. So you don't get that, that contamination peak of phthalates that comes out sometimes. That's a great tip. Um, looks like we got another one relating to liners too. Um, I'm doing headspace analysis. How often should I change my liner? Uh, Zach, if you wanna grab this one. That one is uh, this is a good uh, leading. So that was uh, that was on my mind uh, uh, during uh, Chris's response. With Headspace, your sample it's already volatilized and is in the vapor state by the time it makes its way into the injection port, and so you don't necessarily need to worry about having wool in the inlet liner in that case. Uh, whereas with a split or spotless injection, that's where you would want to. Uh, be sure to have wool, or um, we'll at least strongly consider <laughs> having wool in the, in the inlet liner. Uh, but, um, but returning to the question with headspace, one consideration is that you don't necessarily need wool, 
also, um, it helps to use a inlet liner with a narrower internal diameter, uh, such as two millimeters, as opposed to uh, the larger four millimeter internal diameters. I believe those numbers are right. Um, the again, the reason being is that you're just at that point you're just trying to channel what has already been volatilized onto the GC column. Whereas with a split splitless injection that's an environment in which you want um, a little more volume within the liner so that when the sample volatilizes from a liquid poof to a vapor, it has room to expand without worrying about flashback. A great point here. That's so, what, oh yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> great. I, I don't know how many times to change it. Sorry about that. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, as far as changing it, um, I would say, if you if it's a just a dedicated headspace instrument, um, correct me if I'm wrong on this, uh, y'all, but uh, every hundred injections because it's a clean injection. So every hundred injections, just because you're still that liner still is residing in a hot injection port and will wear out over time. But uh, but help me out on that. Yeah, I, I think that's a good checkpoint, like 100, 200 injection, or even before every analysis, make sure to check it. As Zach mentioned, the liner is in a high temperature always, right? It's at 200 or 250 degrees Celsius. So even though it might look clean, what happens is the deactivation might have gone. Also, there is an O-ring attached to the liner that might actually lose its elasticity because it's uh, continuously subjected to high temperature. So. Before every analysis, it's prudent to cool the inlet, check for uh, uh, the intactness of the liner and see if it is clean. Many times it's gonna be clean with headspace and then proceed uh, uh, on, on at least every two weeks once it's, it's a good idea to open the inlet and do a maintenance. Actually, it looks like we got two questions relating to the, to the topics you guys are hitting upon. Um, one about, about changing out uh, the liner. So, um, is it, do you typically do a hot swap, you know, without cooling the inlet um, with a, with a slightly higher flow rate or cool down the inlet to ambient and then change it out and give it extra time to break out contaminants? I've done both personally. <laughs> I know sometimes you're in a rush and you just want to like, okay, let me just get some uh, tweezers and I'll pull that out hot, you know, and, and put it in. But I think the big consideration is also like personal safety. When you're um, taking off your septa nut and, and opening the inlet, that is metal and it's super hot and you have to be careful not to burn yourself. So it might be a better idea to cool it down first before you change it out and then kind of heat up your your inlet so it can bake off um, some of the contaminants before doing an analysis, but technically you can do either. Cool. And then the, the other the other question in relation to what you guys were talking about was, um, can you describe a little bit about what uh, what deactivation actually means? And then are, are the deactivated liners the best ones to work with uh, basic drugs like meth? Methamphetamine, one of my favorites. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not, not personally, just when I worked in the lab. So thanks for the clarification. Um, I know, gotta clarify. Um, so for methamphetamine and amphetamine, sometimes uh, people have seen split peaks on those compounds specifically with um, certain liner types. And I'm still confused and wondering why that is. Um, I think a few of us have kind of hypothesized, but nothing really has, has panned out. Um, I used a single taper with wool on the bottom for those samples. Um, and if you're doing like a full drug screen, you, you kind of want to have that, that um, wool in there, especially if you're doing other um, drugs of analysis besides meth, like if you're doing slosin, um, mushrooms, or marijuana, that plant material doesn't always come out through your sample preparation, and you want to capture that plant material before it gets onto the column and even onto your column and on your detector if you're doing mass spec specifically. Did that answer? So, the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, Rev, did you want to add something? 
Yeah, so deactivation is basically done to cover the surface of uh, the glass. The glass might have silanols in it, right? So there are different ways to deactivate it, uh, both chemically as well as uh, engineering-wise. You could add a thicker coating, a mission spray coating of uh, deactivation. So it forms a thicker layer and then acts as a barrier between the glass and the amber. So what happens is if this, uh, uh, active spots are still in the liner, then uh, when you send the analyte inside uh, the injector, uh, the analyte will directly adsorb to the liner, it will not make its way to uh, the column. So having a thicker deactivation uh, machine coating or a spray coating of deactivation would actually help with uh, active compounds, especially anything that has nitrogen or anything uh, that has an amine group or carboxyl group are subjected to adsorption very fast. So for these, thicker deactivated coating is very important. Awesome. Looks like we've got a question about O-rings. So uh, Dr. Yuri, I'll head it your way. How often would you recommend changing out O-rings? Uh, O-rings, uh, I believe that it uh, mostly depends on the temperature, what you use it. And then uh, uh, probably we change them every two months. But uh, the, the, in the other labs, uh, here we use it quite pure samples, uh, just the developing columns. Uh, but uh, if you're in your in a real lab uh, working with the real samples, your samples might be dirty. So possibly you need to change in the trees uh, more often. So that's, uh, Ram, if you have uh, more experience on that. <laughs> you read my mind. I think I think he is uh, spot on. Uh, uh, maintaining the inlet, it's like at least once a month. If you open it and see it, it would be good. It also It is also like a case-to-case -case basis. When you open the inlet, you can see if the liner is still, the O-ring is still intact to the liner. If you see that uh, the um, uh, O-ring is not retaining its elasticity, then right away it's time to replace it. So once a month, uh, that's a good one. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, guys. It looks like we got a question in relation to um, uh, on-column split lists and PVT split list injection. Uh, so most of those techniques are suitable for analyzing trace analytes. Uh, what are the advantages, disadvantages of using one over the other? Excellent. I, I would uh, start that. My personal favorite is uh, split injection uh, because split is a faster injection mode but uh, it's not suitable for all type of analysis right so if you have really trace amount of sample then if you split it then only a portion of the sample goes inside the column everything else goes outside right so it goes to the split vent so if you have a sample that has higher concentration then split works perfect split also gives you peak focusing especially for initial peaks Right, but uh, if you go to splitless, what happens is uh, splitless is a slower injection. Uh, there are so many papers that talk about splitless injection. Uh, it says at least a one to two minutes uh, time is taken in the injector for the analyte to completely transfer. And there are also so many method parameters that has to be coordinated with the splitless injection. So your sample uh, inlet temperature and then your column temperature, all these has to be optimized. So there is a, a, a specific optimization that's needed for splitless. However, you're spending, you're sending all the sample onto the column. So if you have trace level of analytes, that's gonna give a good response. Uh, another thing about splitless is since it's slow injection, if your sample is, uh, if it degrades in heat, then those samples are not a good candidate for a splitless injection. Yeah, so those are uh, split and splitless are most common. On column injection is mostly used for hydrocarbon analysis where they don't want to see any like uh, inlet discrimination. So it is a separate set uh, while the popular ones are split and splitless. PTV is a very versatile injection. You can use that as a split. 
split less, you can use it for large volume injection, or you can also use it for fractionating. And uh, the uh, default one is split, split less, everything else is a specialized version. Thanks, Ram. Uh, Chris, I'll head this one your way. How often do you recommend changing liner septum if the operational temperature is about 300 degrees? Uh, it, it'll depend on your analysis. So if um, you're doing something like headspace, like we talked earlier, and it's a super clean sample, you're not going to have to change it as often. Um, however, you still want to change it regularly because like everything else, um, your health, your car, preventive maintenance prevents larger problems down the line. Um, and that'll prevent you from having instrument downtime. So um, cleaner samples, you know, change it every couple weeks. If, if it's a dirtier sample, if you're doing um, like a, a environmental soil analysis or tox, postmortem tox especially, you want to change that more often, maybe every few batches or even more. Um, some people, um, I have one customer in particular who doesn't do a full sample cleanup because there are uh, small amounts of, of um, toxicants in their samples that they really want to get. And so they um, have much dirtier samples. So every single batch they need to change their liner. And, and that's their choice, right? But as long as you're doing it in a way that prevents um, contamination onto the column from either, you know, solid particles or things like that, um, and you're preventing a degradation of your O-ring and your septa, then, you know, change it more often than you think, I guarantee you. Even when you look at your liner to check if it's dirty, even if it doesn't look dirty, oftentimes it can be. So um, keeping those things in mind, it's user preference. I have a question actually for uh, for the panel to kind of build Build on that um, and kind of pick up from the last question. So, um, with a uh, with a PTV, you know, program temperature uh, vaporizer, volatilizer um, injection, you're it's a cold, essentially a cold injection initially, where you inject your sample onto the wall that's in the liner, and then that wall kind of serves as a staging area where, as the liner heats up, commensurate with the oven temperature for the gradient. You know, anodites will heat up and eventually volatilize and go. But um, at the end of the day, that that wool itself is being the stationary. It's going to have all sorts of non-volatile stuff mm -hmm. left on it. So, um, in those cases, how often do you change the liner? Um, is it are you looking at it once every ten injections, or 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 is there a little, a little more flexibility? How do you uh, how do you go about something like that? See, so, yeah, I think it's a really good question, especially when you're talking about PTV. Uh, mostly people that run PTV, they use larger volume sample, right? So when you do more injections, that means you've got to clean the liners more often. So that, that's a that's rule of thumb. Cool. Thanks, Zach. Appreciate it, man. <laughs> okay, looks yeah. like... Uh, we're going to head towards uh, some questions about carrier gases. Um, so Yuri, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, what are the pros and cons of using helium versus hydrogen as the carrier gas? The helium, of course, it's a traditionally used helium people because it's a most inert uh, carrier gas. The recently, the uh, last uh, probably. 10 years, people more and more switching to hydrogen. Because in uh, most cases, hydrogen is also neutral. In a very specific cases, only it could interact with the samples. And uh, the advantage of uh, hydrogen over, uh, over uh, helium is that uh, viscosity. Helium is much more viscous, so at roughly the, your inlet pressure would be two times higher for uh, helium than for hydrogen. Say, especially if you use it longer columns, like uh, 60 meter and longer, let's say 100 meter columns. But uh, usually it's, uh, if there is a choice, it's better to use that uh, hydrogen. So, and then also from the point of uh, uh, the efficiency, the, from my practice at least, that uh, hydrogen provides slightly better uh, efficiency. Peaks are sharper when you use hydrogen 
compared to helium. So my personal recommendation would be use hydrogen whenever it's possible. And uh, if your analytes require a very inert uh, atmosphere, use helium. Helium also, if you remember, it's much more expensive than hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Thanks, Yuri. Um, actually, a similar question, you know, along those same lines is um, the carrier gas and pros and cons. But yeah, maybe I'll head this your way. Um, can you clarify the distinctions between carrier gas and makeup gases, and then the pros and cons uh, of the different gases that are typically used for those functions? Oh, here's that uh, I do not have much experience on that. Uh, to be honest, okay, okay. We we typically use that makeup gas uh, nitrogen, and uh, here I'm not uh, that uh, expert uh, to 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 convince you or whatever to give a special recommendations why they do not we do not use other gases. My uh, specialty. Uh, it's uh, mostly it's uh, making new stationary phases, and uh, I'm uh, I'm very conservative in the conditions what I use, and uh, I use uh, typically uh, hydrogen as a carrier gas and uh, nitrogen as a makeup gas, and then uh, if someone knows that better conditions for makeup gas, I cannot argue with it. So. Yes, so Yuri brought up a good point. It's like uh, the method parameters, there is always a default parameter that you can start with. There is no necessity to like reinvent the wheels because it's like it works and it works for everything. But uh, just to uh, tell what's the basic difference between a carrier gas and a makeup gas, carrier gas goes through the column, makeup gas doesn't go through the column. It's just a part of the detector gas. Makeup gas is just to push the analyte that comes out of the column into the flame. So. Perfect. Thank you guys. Um, all right. I think Zach, I'll head this one your way. Um, I, I'm looking uh, for a fast analysis or, or faster analysis. What are the aspects I should consider to speed up my analysis? Very good question. <laughs> um, the, if your method has been developed and you're happy with the resolution that you've established, then that's where you can um, consider the, the dimensions of your columns, specifically the internal diameter, your film thickness, and then finally the length of your column. The internal diameter will determine how frequently your analyte will interact with the stationary phase that lines the uh, interior of the column. So the narrower the ID, the more interactions you're going to have. More interactions leads to higher what we call theoretical heights. Um, the, and then the second consideration is the film thickness. The thinner the film, the faster the, um, trans the transition of your analyte into and out of the stationary phase. That's your mass transfer, your C term for the Van Diepter curve. Um, so what you can do is, first of all, use a narrower and a thinner film, both of which lead to a much higher number of theoretical plates. At that point, you um, your resolution will actually improve, increase, so you can chop off the length, some length of your column. You now have a shorter column that preserves your initial resolution because as you chopped off your column, you're now shrinking the plates back down to what they originally were, but with a shorter column. With smaller internal diameters, you know, the, the, a lot of folks consider, you know, think to themselves, well, am I using, I'm using a slower flow. So is that going to make my method slower? Well, you need to consider um, that the internal volume of your column has now shrunk. And so the flow is just volume per unit of time. So the slower, the lower flow will still lead to the same linear velocity along the length of your column. Now that you have a shorter column, same linear velocity, you have a shorter method that still preserves the resolution of your original method. Sorry, you give a thumbs up over here. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, 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 good, good overall explanation. 
Hmm. Um, it looks like we have a, a, a couple uh, questions jumping into our, our category of columns and applications. So um, this first one, uh, actually two of them relate to uh, short chain fatty acids, which I know are always a big topic for, for GC analysis. So um, Ram, maybe I'll head this one your way. Um, sure. What is your best column for detection of short chain fatty acids? Um, also, would you suggest a different column depending on which solvent was used to prepare the samples, water versus uh, ethyl acetate? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So this is a good question, especially uh, acids. When we talk about acids, we are talking about active compounds, right? Uh, when we talk about acids, we are talking about polar separation. So uh, chemistry-wise, like dissolves, like works best for your separation, right? So acids are polar, so go for a polar column. Uh, when we talk about polar column, uh, best choice in polar selectivity is wax, right? So wax is made of polyethylene glycol, which is polar. However, remember that uh, the wax column would have terminal hydroxyl groups in it. So now if you take the organic acid, you could straight run it without derivatization, or you could do a methyl ester derivative of the organic acid and run it. So if you're doing a straight run without derivatization, then ZBFFAP is the right choice. FFAP stands for free fatty acid profiling column. So in this column, it is a polyethylene glycol based phase, but uh, the terminal hydroxyl groups are actually esterified to nitroterephthalic group. So you don't have a lot of hydrogen bonding interaction. So you get sharper peaks for underivatized organic acid. When you go to a derivatized organic acid as a methyl ester, then there are like two different choices. You can go for a wax selectivity, or if you want to further uh, distinguish uh, cis from a trans version, then fame is a great choice. Uh, even in wax, there are two varieties. We have a ZB wax and a ZB wax plus. So if you use uh, ethyl acetate or methylene chloride as a solvent, then uh, we would recommend uh, ZB wax. If you have water-based sample, then there should be special treatment that has to be done to the column. Meaning if you take the column, column is polar, right? So if you inject water, water is polar, it might really actually dissolve some of the stationary phase, mainly the monomer in it, and then spit it out. When, you, when this happens, you'll get irreproducible results. Uh, while making ZB wax plus, what we did is we did an extensive cross-linkage of the stationary phase, and we did a thorough solvent rinsing process. So when you get the column, it is only intact cross-linked polymer, and it's 100% compatible with water. So water-based sample, uh, water-based uh, organic acid as a methyl ester, I would recommend a wax plus. If it's ethyl acetate, I would go for wax. Cool, thanks, Ryan. <laughs> uh, the, the second question um, has to do a, a, also with short chain, but I, I think it has to do more with uh, you know setting up a, a temperature. So, um, Marissa, maybe I'll head this one your way. Uh, I'm a graduate student working on a Shimatsu 2010 GC. Um, my instrument column temperature starts at 100 degrees, but you want to steep up from 50 degrees so it can measure short chain fatty acids. Okay. Um, it, that's possible. I wouldn't know exactly how to do that. Um, I've, I don't think I've ever worked with the, the lower temps um, on GC only because uh, most things that I've, I've worked with have been either volatile or semi-volatile. So you really want to get them volatilized and, and then onto the column kind of thing. Um, so by starting it at a low temperature, the only things that you have to worry about is if your sample doesn't fully volatilize before it gets onto the column, you're going to get um, some, um, the, the front of your column is going to get dirty, which is going to affect your analysis. So um, how to do that, I'd refer either to Ram or Zach on that. Sure. So yeah, um, when you start at lower temperature, what actually happens is you're increasing the peak focusing, right? You're letting the analyte inside the column for longer time 
for it to uh, interact with the stationary phase. So especially when you're talking about really low boiling analytes, when the organic acid that we're talking about is of very low boiling point, then that gives you a chance to uh, interact uh, with the stationary phase. Uh, there are like a lot of options uh, for you, uh, especially when you're dealing with volatile compounds. One good way to actually retain the analyte is to go for a thicker film stationary phase. Uh, general uh, column for retaining really uh, volatile, uh, really volatile analyte is a ZB 624 or 624 plus. These columns are thicker core, thicker firm, so it will retain the initial analytes. Also, ZB 624 plus is a premium deactivation, so it gives good peak shape for acids and bases. Thanks, Ram. Um... Zach, I think I'll head this one your way. Uh, what are the best organic solvents to use with GC in terms of the least effect on the stationary phase? Um, sorry, question. Sorry, a big question. Uh, um, the, it, it actually goes back to uh, what Yuri had presented and what Ram uh, Kumar had uh, reinforced, which is um, just the idea of like dissolving like um, match do your best to match the polarity of your, your sample diluent with the polarity of your stationary effects. So like our, Z, our ZB1 um, or any one column or five column, those are low polarity stationary phases for which the diluents, the sample diluents are often hexane, dichloromethane, ethyl acetate, things of that nature. And then um, as you progress towards uh, the more polar stationary phases, your, your ZB35, your ZB50, um, and certainly your wax phases, uh, that's when you see um, like IPA, methanol, ethanol as your uh, sample diluents. But what is um, what can be interesting is, is with the ZB5, you can get away with using methanol as your sample diluent. Uh, you'll see a little, um, the problem is that the problem there is that the methanol in, ex in excess will tail and that will interfere with um, any low boiling analytes that you would really leave close to the methanol, whereas um, methanol as an analyte would be pretty much a sharp peak on a, on a low polarity column, but it still tails a little. But uh, going back to the question solvent, when it comes to the actual solvent, you're dealing with a much larger amount. So that's where you want to be mindful of matching the polarity of the solvent with the polarity of the molecules, as this will also play a role in how your analytes themselves uh, focus into sharp peaks at the beginning of your method when you uh, have that solvent focusing step. Hopefully, Great, thanks, Zach. Yes, yeah, that, that's great. Chris, I, I think I'll, th I'll throw this one um, to you. Um, how often do you recommend changing the gold seals? Um, and is it recommended that used gold seals not be reused after cleaning? Hey, when people clean and reuse gold seals, <laughs> it's kind of, I, I mean, it can be done. I just don't recommend it. Um, I usually do, um, a uh, change the gold seal not as often as I would change like the liner and the septa and and those kinds of things. Um, I usually if I'm doing like a full inlet maintenance, um, I clean my my split vent um, and trap and and then you know change the gold seal, um, the liner, the septa, and the syringe, um, and then I also clean the the foot of the plunger for the syringe as well because that actually comes in contact with the bottom of the syringe and i just feel weird about that <laughs> um uh, and and cross contamination um and i usually do that every couple months uh just kind of as a preventive maintenance it's not a full pm so you, you don't kind of have to do everything but it's it's nice to do um because it's cleaner, you're gonna get a better uh, analysis and, and you're gonna get a cleaner chromatogram as well. So every couple months, I would recommend changing the gold seal. And although technically you can uh, use a cleaned gold seal, it, it is better to do a new one, especially if you're using um, like our easy seals, those have double the gold. And so it makes them softer and when you tighten it down, it creates 
um, like a complete air seal and you don't need a washer for it. That being said, if you're cleaning that and reusing it, maybe that seal is kind of off and it's gonna re um, mold onto, onto that base, inlet base. And it might not remold in the same way and you might get a little bit of air leak. So using a new one is, is preferred. Um, and with that change the, um, if you're not using something like the Easy Seal, change the washer with it as well. Excellent, great feedback. Thanks, Krista. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let's see. Next question coming through. Um, perfect, okay. Ram, I'll throw this one to you. Uh, this one's specific about uh, pesticide analysis. Um, so he says, I, I run a list of 40 different pesticides on a five phase. Um, two of these give fronting peak uh, while fronting peaks while the others don't. What what could be the reason? Yeah, this is a good question that people often like get confused. They might right away say, hey, uh, the column is not good. Can I get a replacement column kind of thing? But when we look at the chromatographic profile here, out of 40, only two are giving a problem, right? That means uh, this two peak is not compatible with the column, right? So let's go back to the polarity of a five. It is a low polar selectivity, right? So just by giving this fact, I would say that this specific analyte might be a polar analyte. It's not matching with the stationary phase. So it's deviating the surface and uh, it's overloading. That's why you get a fronting peak. So the best option here is you can go for a mid-polar selectivity column like a ZB multi-residue one and two or ZB CL pesticide one and two. Another option is you can also add, if it is, if those peaks are really close to the solvent and that's when it's giving a problem, you can actually first take your five phase, add a retention gap and see if uh, the retention gap helps focus the actual solvent away from the pesticide and that solves the issue. So first I would try a retention gap with the existing column. If that doesn't work, then I would go for a uh, uh, multi-residue type phase, which is mid-polar selectivity. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Dr. Yuri, uh, this is a, a kind of a general question that came through. Um, can you just talk a little bit about column bleed um, and kind of in relation to column lifetime? Yes, uh, column bleed, uh, if you compare that columns made some 30 years ago, that uh, the level of bleed was very high at that time. But uh, the columns made uh, the last uh, by manufacturers last say 10 years, that uh, bleeding level is much lower. Why? Because uh, during that uh, time, people at, uh, who work in, in this field uh, realize that the uh, reasons why columns are bleeding. So the main problems here that uh, the, uh, related to, to the nature of a stationary phase. So it depends on what kind of polymer you use as a stationary phase. What's the molecular weight of this phase? If there is a low molecular weight uh, portion in your stationary phase, you definitely have a bleeding problem. And then also it depends on uh, if your uh, if the stationary phase cross-linked or not. After cross-linking, that bleeding goes down. Uh, also, another factor is that uh, the deactivation of the column that uh, that uh, the, the the manufacturers uh, like Synamonix uh, commonly will do that. We deactivate the surface of a. Uh, um, few silica and then apply that the stationary phase. It uh, helps uh, to reduce that the bleeding. And then also bleeding depends also, of course, on temperature. If you, increase, if you work in at higher temperature, the stationary phase degrades uh, faster and you have a higher bleeding. Also, the bleeding depends on the dimensions of the column. It's uh, roughly proportional to the amount of uh, of a stationary phase, what you have in a in a column. So, say if you are working with a 0.25 millimeter glass, uh, uh, your bleeding would be lower than if you use at a 
say 0.53 millimeter glass. And then also it's uh, roughly proportional to the length of the column for the same reason and the film thickness what you, you see for the same uh, diameter of the column. If you have thicker film thickness, bleeding is higher. And then also the another factor is that um, the depends uh, on how you rinse that uh, column. So to, re to reduce uh, the bleeding level, you can try to rinse the column. The say uh, cross-linked uh, stationary phases, they are rinseable. You can rinse uh, uh, using different stationary uh, sorry, solvents like pentane is most, uh, most uh, common probably. But if it pentane doesn't help, uh, you can try to use a dimethyl methylene chloride, um, which uh, removes that uh, impurities that stay in stationary phase, uh, phase, absorb irreversibly, and then cause the bleeding. And then also, if uh, you have a real big problem with the bleeding cause that caused by your sample, the dirty sample. Uh, probably it's a good idea to use that uh, guard columns, guard, guard columns attached uh, guard columns or uh, guardian, internal guardian columns, what you make here at the uh, uh, your choice. So probably these all factors what influence at the uh, bleeding. So it's... Uh, no. Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say another thing to, to be aware of is if you have oxygen on your column, if you've like recently done inlet maintenance or something, um, when air is on the column um, and then is heated up, it will oxidize and pull off that station. Oh, yes. You, you should, uh, I forgot to mention that uh, the, the carrier gas should be free of as much as possible of oxygen and uh, moisture that uh, we saw that constantly that uh, oxygen and the moisture, they easily destroy that the stationary phase at a high temperature. So carrier gas should be ultra high purity quality. I think you hit upon a good question, Yuri. Like the, the secondary side of that is, um, somebody was asking about that, but our recommendations for traps and filters, you know, prior to the column. Um, oh, yes, at, uh, yes, we, at, uh, every lab probably use them. We always use these traps, the filters, and then we do not work without using these traps and the filters. Otherwise, that the lifetime of your column would be much shorter. Sorry, Ram, I know you wanted to jump in. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Zebron gas management is the best for uh, uh, gas traps gas filter types because it's like a, a bench top installation uh, it's a plug-in style you can install it within 20 seconds you don't have to disrupt the line uh, it's a spring loaded feature so you can without even disturb stopping the flow you can uh, change the cartridge and it's bench top installation with indicator so when it's time to change it's going to alarm you we have two types of indicator one is the color indicator uh, in the gas filter and then we have an electric indicator both of these are going to tell you in advance when you have to buy and stock uh, a replacement filter Perfect. so here we are talking about just like two ppm impurity uh, and uh, it, it doesn't take like too much time for a 1.5 to a 2 ppm uh, so it's like sooner we change it we actually save the column and in many times uh, it's also the detector usually the detectors are really expensive like ecd or mass spec uh, source you don't want to yeah you don't want to uh, ruin those so prevention is better than cure here Actually, on the on the subject of GCMS, uh, I'm going to combine two of these questions. So, um, Chris, I think I'll, I'll, I'll head this your way. Um, which uh, phenomenics columns typically have the lowest bleed for GCMS? And then I, I think that combines well with the, the question about, you know, standard columns in the Zebron line versus the plus phases, if you want to highlight some, some differences. Yeah, so all of the Zebron columns are mass spec certified. So it doesn't matter if you're choosing a ZB1 or a ZB1MS, um, you can use that with GCMS. Uh, the, the, the big thing though with uh, using like the ZB1 plus, which is our ZB1MS, 
is that it will um, have more and better deactivation. And so that will be better for um, mass spec use because you're not gonna get as much bleed. That bleed um, from, from any column or any manufacturer eventually deposits onto your ion source on the mass spec and you will have to clean that. So uh, the um, higher end columns, the like the plus line, which, which are uh, more deactivated and have better um, deactivation, those are gonna be something you wanna invest in if you're using a mass spec, because when you are having to clean your ion source, your your whole instrument is down much longer. Um, and, and that's something you, you just wanna avoid doing as much as possible. Um, along with that, when you have contamination on your mass spec source, it's gonna show up in your chromatograms. And so you might not get the results that you you think that you should be getting, and that could be a reason. It might not be, um, you know, a dirty sample. It could be a dirty source. So it's better um, to kind of like bring in a few things. It's better to clean your sample beforehand. So you know, invest in sample prep, but also, like Yuri mentioned, having a gas trap to keep your gas as pure as possible is also going to give you better results. And then having a more inert column. Um, like uh, our plus line, whether it's a ZB5 plus, a ZB1 plus, is going to, to give less bleed and therefore better results and have a cleaner source at the end of all that. And then also here that if, if you have a choice and uh, would like to go for lower bleeding column, uh, commonly non-polar uh, columns have lower bleeding than uh, more polar columns. So if you have a choice that you can use uh, so okay, you can switch from higher polar uh, column to lower polar column. If you do that, uh, your bleeding commonly goes down. So it uh, uh, depends on the chemistry here. Polar columns are polar stationary phases are not so inert like a uh, non-polar. So they more easily uh, destroyed and then uh, causing uh, bleeding. Thank you, Yuri and Krista. Uh, Zach, I, I think I'll head this one your way. It has to do with mass spec also. Um, I'm looking for trace level detection of nitrosamines. I'm assuming from like certain drugs and pharmaceutical drug substances. Uh, which detector should I use? And do you have some, uh, some good application examples? Um, very good question. Um, you know, certainly mass spec would be uh, um, one one option for uh, for very, for low level sensitivity um, in tandem with a column that's uh, um, developed specifically for exhibiting low bleed, such as uh, like in our case we have an example of uh, NDMA and uh, um, NDEA on our 64 plus. Um, but uh, beyond that, um, other detectors. Uh, that's where you can delve into detectors that are selective for specific classes of analytes, such as uh, if you can get creative and go with a, a nitrogen phosphorus detector, an NPD, uh, which, um, and a, and a, which detects exclusively nitrogen-containing compounds or phosphorus-containing compounds through a, a rubidium um, flame source. Uh, or you could uh, roll with a um, an ECD detector knowing that you have um, electronegative nitrogens uh, within your uh, um, um, chemical structure. Uh, once again, just the, the selectivity of the detector, um, apart from every, you know, all the other um, anodes within the sample, allows for greater sensitivity. But at the end of the day, mass spec is kind of the most universal means of uh, high sensitivity you know, for when working with you know, trace levels of anodes. Um, and then the end, and then again, it also just comes to just consider not just a matter of the detector, but optimizing your method, you know, for uh, sharp peaks, finding the right uh, stationary phase. Again, uh, we would recommend a 64 or 64 plus stationary phase for those analytes, specifically because the 64 features a mix of both uh, cyan or purple groups and phenyl groups, in addition to the uh, um, just the low level, the low to moderate level of the phase. So that will help to uh, sharpen the peaks of these secondary interactions. And uh, as, as uh, the, I could 
uh, Zachary mentioned that uh, 624 plus and 624, 624 plus columns are, uh, they have different stages that uh, functional groups. So because of this, these columns are very versatile. So say if you do not know which column to use for your samples to for, to begin and uh, uh, to start your anal analysis, and uh, it's a good point to start try to use that 624 plus first, and then then from this uh, you can figure out that uh, what you use a lower polarity or higher polarity, but the probably the most versatile column available in the market is a 624 plus uh, columns. Okay. So uh, to add to what you said, uh, 624 plus has highest temperature limit uh, of that class. It has 300, 320 max temperature. Uh, it's also a thicker film stationary phase. So in this case, nitrosamines are volatile analytes, right? So you want to retain them. They are also active. This column is a premium deactivation uh, that can take care of active compounds. And then it's mass spec certified extensively cross-linked, so you get low bleed. Even though the nitrosamine eludes earlier, even before like 300, when you do mass spec, it's very important to maintain the mass spec transfer line at higher temperature. For example, all your analyte eludes at 250, then it's a good idea to maintain the transfer line at 280 or 300. So if, you, if the column can actually handle that higher temperature, then it's beneficial. It's going to extend the lifetime of the column. So ZB624 plus is a great choice for nitrosamine. Uh, we have a couple of tech notes as well as uh, uh, on-demand webinars about this. Uh, I would really appreciate uh, this question. And then uh, I, would, uh, I would be happy to talk to the customer more about this method. Perfect. Well, thank you all. Um, so we're we're gonna um, we're at the top of the hour, a little after. So uh, first off, thank you everybody, all the attendees and registrants, you know, for for signing up and and shooting across your your questions to our our panelists. Um, if your question you know didn't did get answered, don't worry, we're we're gonna uh, you know shoot you back an email or you know even a phone call thereafter um, in the coming days to get you your answers. Um, if you come up with additional questions, you know, going forward, you know, always you, you can reach us, at, you know, directly, you know, your, your account managers, but you can also reach us pretty much 24-7 um, if you go to www.phenomenix.com backslash chat now, or you just show up to our website and I'm sure there's a button that will say <laughs> chat with us right away. Yeah. Um, you know, it really appreciative to, to have uh, everybody here. You know, Yuri, Ram, Zach, Krista, thank you for spending your time and, and sharing your knowledge with the team. Um, it's it's just fun, you know, in this environment to, to be able to share, you know, some of the tips and tricks that, that you guys have used. Um, the next Inside the Lab will be coming up. So, you know, stay tuned for, for that subject. Um, and like always, you know, please in your own, you know, home life and lab life, stay sane, stay healthy and stay curious about chromatography. Okay, thank you all. Bye. <laughs>